All right, hi everyone. Settle down. Shh. All right. We we good? We start? We can start? Whenever you're ready. Okay, good. All right. How's everyone doing? Good weekend? Yeah, everyone have a nice weekend? All right, so I, I my parents, I swear, they came ten minutes after the class finished. Because they had to stop and get them to eat first. So they, they totally missed the class. So I was I'll say about that. But they did come for a night class, which was fun. And uh, we went to Austin this weekend. And anyone here from Austin went to UT? It was okay. I mean, you know, the cat, the cap. Ha <laughs> ha! Gotcha. No, no, I liked it. I mean, well, I like it because I think I thought the Capitol is pretty cool. I think it's, it's an awesome structure. We walked around the Capitol grounds. Uh, I took them by the Johnson Library, which was kind of cool. Um, I took them to Sixth Street during the day. I never actually been there during the day, and it's very different. Uh, it's very quiet and not much going on. Uh, but but it was like it was like maybe like you know eleven or twelve a.m. on a Saturday, so there wasn't really anything doing. We just got lunch. But I have to say, the coolest part of the trip was actually Bucky's. Yeah. <laughs> How have I not discovered this place was unreal? I've I've never seen something that big before. It was like it was like a Costco or something. It was huge. No, but I we did get some pictures though. But uh, it's cool when you first walk in. It's like welcome to Bucky's, and my my parents were just laughing and stuff because they'd never seen that much stuff in a place. And I'm mean, put like a cowboy hat on, and she was like being a total city slicker. It was, it was kind of funny. Uh, but it was it was a pretty pretty good trip. Uh, next time we're going to do San Antonio because my mom wants to do that next time. So I'll do do the Alamo next. She kept asking, "Is the Alamo here?" I'm like, "No, no, wrong city, mom." <laughs> New Yorkers don't conceive of Texas. That's not a that's not a thing. It's Riverwalk. Riverwalk. Got it. All right. Anyone else doing anything fun this weekend? Anything more fun than Bucky's? Anything? No. Nothing. All right, and I saw. I think I think I saw almost all of you at that orientation thing on Friday. Were all, all of you there? Almost all of you there? Did it, did it, people find that useful? Yeah. 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 <laughs> he was at my table. That's why he's saying yes. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a. I don't know. I mean, I think it's somewhat mislabeled. You don't really have much choice in what classes you register for this semester. I think it's just more of an opportunity to talk to professors and kind of get advice. That's, that's the way I look at it. Because, I mean, when they say you're not going to register for the classes you want, they mean it. I mean, you won't get into the stuff you want. They'll be filled. So you're going to take just the basic classes that none of you want to actually take. Uh, it, yeah, I mean, that's just a ma matter of math. I think I saw a couple, a couple of your kids, one or two, I think I saw. I saw the mutton busting champion, but I guess her, her, her mommy's not here today. So I guess that a... Uh, what happened? Fourth? How many kids are we talking about? Like, wow! Does he advance the next round? Top dogs and mutton busting. I like that. All right. Uh, anyone else have anything fun? Anything? Okay. All right. So let's let's get started. Um, any questions on co-ownership one? I want to. I'll do a mini review with the uh, with the Swartz uh, bow case, which I think is actually raises some of the similar issues. Any any questions from last time? No. All right. Let's start with the Swartz bow v. Samson. That was the that was the California case from uh with the yes, there's a flip through notes with the uh, with the boxing building. We'll, I'll come back to the other two cases afterwards. Okay. Everyone frantically flips. Swartz bow v. Samson, right? You got it. The last case. All right, all right. Where did I uh, where did I drop off last time? Anyone remember? Were you you ended with you, so I'm gonna go to him next. Uh, lo lo love that neighbor, right? Yeah. All right, all right. You're up. All right, <laughs> all right. No, this 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 is a good case. All right. So tell me what 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 was the setup in this case? What were the facts? Um, the plaintiff was husband and wife. They right. Had joint tenants. Okay, let, let's but before you before you stop, let's actually just do a mini review. So the husband and wife were joint tenants, right? What does that mean? What what what's required to have a joint tenancy? They both have to have ownership in the land. There 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 a couple things that have to happen. So we did last week. Let's see. Amber, do you remember what are the what, what are the things that are necessary in order to have a joint tenancy? You just look it up. Yeah, how many unities were there? Four. Yes. What were those four unities? 
time, title, interest, and possession. And again, TTIP, I mean, the exam will be open book, but this one's easy enough to remember. TTIP, okay? And all right, so, so Jack, you walk through, what, what, what do those four unities mean? Time, they have to own at the same time. They have to acquire at the same time, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, what about, what, what about title? They both have to possess time. Okay. They both have to have a common interest, and they both have to have a Right, okay, so time, they have to acquire at the same time. Okay, title, they have to acquire through the same instrument or the same, you know, document to convey. The interest has to be the same, and, and let's see, uh, Sophie, how do we define the interest of two joint tenants? How do we define what their interest is? Yeah, yeah, I mean, actually, equal but undivided, but yeah, that's, that's, that's the right idea. Equal and undivided, okay? The idea is they each have access to the entirety of the parcel. No one of the joint tenants has any more control than the other, okay? And then, Jack, the last one, possession. They have to have possession at the same time, right? The last one, the possession, is going to be the subject of the first two cases you read involving ouster, right, of when one joint tenant does something to kick out the other joint tenant, okay? But this, this question is a little bit, little bit trickier. Okay, so let's see. Um, all right. I, I did, did you have one in this middle? Okay, all right, back up there. All right, Aaron, so what, what happened with this husband and wife? When, what did they, uh, what, how, how does this uh, matrimonial bliss go awry? Um, I think this uh, One of them, well, they're doing their business, they're falling out or something like that. I'm on business, and one of them got hurt. And so one of them got hurt and couldn't uh, just in the bed for some time. So. I mean, it was a property issue. Yeah. Patrick, you got this? The husband executed a lease uh, that she didn't agree to. Okay, so what was the nature of the lease? Um, that he was gonna was he gonna use it for a, to build a boxing ring? Right, right. Okay. So you have husband and wife. The husband executes a lease to allow this guy Samson to come in to build a boxing ring, a boxing pavilion. Okay. Did the wife want this transaction to happen? Okay. So the wife didn't want this to happen. Okay. So think about it this way: when you have two joint tenants, they each have this equal and undivided interest in the land, right? Does writing this lease, uh, let's see, Stuart, does writing this lease destroy the joint tenancy? Does it destroy any of these four unities? No. Why not? Well, it's just a lease. It's not, they're not um, transferring others to it. What about the first one, title? Oh, I mean, the, uh, the second one, title. Does, that, does the wife still? same ownership over the land, she just objects to the lease. Right, no, but my, my question more precisely is how, okay, we say that all the interests have to be together, that's being the same instrument, right? How does the lease, right, this new lease, not violate the, uh, the title one? She, she doesn't, uh, she doesn't accept it, so... Oh, no, she didn't accept it. What do you think, Adam? Well, the lease that the husband executes doesn't sell the land. He's giving temporary access to um, to a third party, and the court looks at it as, essentially, they talk about how he's doing that with his interests only of the land, mm -hmm. compared to that of, like, um, it, encroaching in onto her interests that she has in the land. Okay. So this this goes to the broader issue of how do we define the interest, right? So we should be really precise. It's not in the fact, but we can assume that they own this land, fee simple, as joint tenants, right? If they each have an equal undivided interest as fee simple, what happens when you cut a leasehold out of that fee simple interest? Does that negate? If he's simple, what do you think, Andrew? 
Oh, because you still own it, they're just using it. It's not the product of their own for Okay, and, and we haven't really covered this, but there's a really big difference between owning and leasing. Right? I think I alluded to it, but I didn't make a big deal. We'll talk about leaseholds a little bit a little bit later. But there's a big difference. Why are they different? Because it's meant to be temporary in nature. Same thing for uh, kind of like a you know a lease that all of you sign with your, your apartments. It's un it's undoubted that the person who's leasing land to you is not giving you any kind of permanent interest. It's meant to be temporary. Okay. But Matthias, there's also a related issue though. Possession. If you have this tenant here, and he's opening up his boxing, uh, 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 his boxing area, is a wife allowed to use that area? Is she, is she being excluded from that area? Sorry again. If this guy's building a boxing ring on her land, right? Is a wife being excluded from there? Is her possession being denied? So I, I, I think I think I hear what you're saying. Does the mere fact that this is being built deny a possession by itself? No. What has to happen for it to be denied possession? Well, if she comes in and gets into the house, yeah. No. So they ch they charge her admission fee, which would she have a claim for uh, probably Aster? For example. If they if they made they made her buy a ticket to enter. Yeah. Yeah. So even though technically, you know, part of her land is being used in a way she doesn't want, she still has possession. So we go through the four of them, all four of them are still combined, right? The title, even though there's this new lease, it doesn't vitiate the fee simple interest they share. And also the <laughs> possession. Even though there's something being built on her land, she can still go there. Now, if they put a lock on the pavilion or they barricaded it up, like a, like, a, like a national monument or something, then she'd have a cause of action. Yes, ma'am? Couldn't um, the wife in this case have made the uh, lessee's life or time there on the property as a living hell? <laughs> what what do you mean? <laughs> like the gentleman is building a boxing, you know, uh, a, a boxing arena for, right. you know, for vice to be held. If he brings out a construction company to construct the building, she hires another construction company to demo Everything that they're Immediately, doing. the like second he builds it, she demolishes it. Okay. What, I'm wondering, how does the court handle because both of them? If that lessee has been given the rights that her her husband, who's the joint tenant, is like a a temporary joint tenant mm -hmm. of sorts, might he have grounds for like damage her damaging those that building or would, that would the lessee have? Okay, so I, I don't think we cover this in this class, but um, generally speaking, any damages would probably go to the husband, because the what would happen is if the um, if the wife I'm sorry if, if the lessee wanted to sue the wife, he couldn't because he's not in privity with her. We didn't do that, right. but generally he would have to sue the <coughs> husband, and the husband would then bring the wife into that suit. That's how it would work. Okay. Amongst joint, let's take the lessee out of the equation. Let's just have joint tenants, yeah. uh, co-tenants. Um, in those, in that case, uh, if she, if the husband builds something and the wife, who's a co-tenant, decides that she doesn't want it there, mm -hmm. there's still grounds for, even though that's her right. Well, what, what a, happens? What happens in the second case where there's the one place with all the garbage being kept in the building, all the all the junk, in the warehouse? They pretty much said that that's okay unless you, have to deal with it. you can exclude, unless you can show that you right. excluded her. So, I mean, he, here's the rub, right? <clears throat> Joint tenancy is not efficient. Okay. Right. right? It's not efficient. And I was going to do this later when we do the um, we, we do the, 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 the Alabama case with the warehouse. But if any of you ever had a roommate, I'm sure it happens that often you couldn't quite agree if you had to use the land in the best way. Right? You want to keep some stuff here. You want to keep some stuff there. He wants to keep it clean. He wants to eat out everything in the refrigerator, right? There's always going to be these conflicts. And this is nothing inherent in, in this kind of arrangement. It's impossible to um, live with someone else without having these issues come up. So, for example, at the beginning, it talks about relations among co-owners. Uh, the, the book gives this, this quote. Um, Each tenant 
owns an equal interest in all the fee simple, and each has equal right of possession of the whole. Okay? Then it says, neither a joint tenant nor a tenant common to do, can do any act to the prejudice of his co-tenant in their estate. Okay? It says, let me read it again. Neither a joint tenant nor a tenant in common can do any act to the prejudice of his co-tenant. But let's think about this for a second. Okay, so we have A and B. They're joint tenants. A can't do anything to the prejudice of B, right? B can't do anything to harm A. What the hell can they do? Anything any of you do will impact your, your roommate. Anything. If you want to watch TV, that means he can't go to sleep, right? If he eats what's in the fridge, you lose your food. Anything two people do will impact one another. So this statement the book gives is absolutely meaningless. Because it's impossible for two people to live together that bother each other in some respect. Like, even if like identical twins like doing everything exactly the same, if one person is in the bathroom, the other person can't go. It's just it's a matter of physics. So there's this inherent uh, conflict of what they call reciprocal rights. I mentioned earlier the Coase theorem, the idea when you have two neighbors and one's polluting and you know one's blocking the sunlight, you're always going to have these conflicts among neighbors, and you cannot get rid of it. So what courts try to do, and this is what the subject is of the first two cases. It's talk about efficiency and fairness and how to split up the, uh, the ownership of the different properties. Okay? So I'm guessing in your case, if you have one guy building a box ring and you have this, this, this belligerent wife demolishing it, they would probably want to partition the land. That would probably be a good yeah. that, that, that would probably make a good good use of the land. Let let him have the boxing ring, let her not go on there anymore. Okay. Let's, but we'll we'll come back to those two cases in a minute. Let's finish the first case though. So I think we we all understand that there's no um, severance of the joint tenancy. So that means that still husband and wife is still joint tenants. Uh, let's see. Uh, Alex, can the wife then cancel this lease, which her name was not on? Why not? Mm -hmm. So let's be more precise. <clears throat> was a husband leasing... Uh, what exactly was the husband leasing? Be more precise. What part of the land? Uh, let's see, Thomas. What what exactly was was the husband leasing? Yes. Okay. As long as the husband's only in leasing his interest in the land, they're cool. Right? If I'm a joint tenant in Fee Simple, I can lease my joint tenancy. Now, don't think 50-50. I don't like you to think like that. But he's leasing his own interest. Uh, let's see. David, what happened if the husband said he wanted to lease the entirety of the land, all of it? That, you know, the lease said, I, husband, lease the entirety of the land. Would that be allowed? Yeah, How could he lease the entire land if he doesn't own the entire thing himself? If you're a joint tenant, can you convey the entirety of the land? What can you what can you only convey? So if the husband purported to convey the entirety of the land, would that be permissible? No, that'd be void. So if we're a joint tenant, all that you can convey is what you own. And so effectively in the lease, you'd have to write, I convey my joint tenancy in fee simple. Yes, sir. That would be a probably good case where partition would be appropriate, right? Because 99 acres, but the gold's the problem, right? Like that. <laughs> I tried it. I stopped it. <laughs> <laughs> There's this funny uh, meme going around where these, these husband and wife and they have you know, football jerseys, and the uh, guy says 99 and says problems, and then the girl says number one and eight. <laughs> Google that later. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Yes. I love, I, love, I love the delayed reactions. That's part of the job. Okay, but that's right. Okay, but it also happens that often, and this is where, this is where it gets. We'll do this when we do family law next week. Imagine husband and wife own properties joint tenancy. Husband's running a little bit short on money. He mortgages a property without telling the wife. Right? Is that permissible? 
What do you think? Yeah, here. Uh, Cherry. Is that what it's doing? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's referenced briefly in the book, I think. No. Why not? Because it would... Would, would the mortgage sever any of these four interests? No, I said mortgage. Oh, mortgage. Yeah, yeah. The example is the husband places a mortgage in the property without the wife's knowledge. It wouldn't what? Think about it. Would a mortgage sever any of these four joint interests? Would it? Would, would they both still have titles to land? It's, a, it's, actually, it's actually a close question. It's actually split among jurisdictions. Most places say you can't. Right? Well, you do mortgage as a property too, but it's actually permissible for a husband to think about it this way to place a mortgage on his undivided share. I, I think so. Yeah, you can you can place a mortgage on your undivided share. Now, the husband couldn't place a mortgage on the entirety of the property; he just put it on his own share. That didn't make the bank the joint tenant. No. The bank, bank would get the title. The, the, no, 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 no. Well, and you'll do you'll do mortgage next semester, but it's not exactly the bank getting the title. The bank actually gets an interest in the title, to be really precise. In, in most places, during the pendency of a mortgage, the homeowner keeps the title, and the bank shows an interest on it. So then when the person who took out the mortgage, when he dies, would the bank wouldn't have an interest in land, right? It would just go to do the right of survivorship. It would go to the wife. Yes, but but, but 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 the rub is, and I, I don't want to do mortgages now. The the wife's property will be taken subject to the interest of the mortgage. In other words, the mortgage doesn't disappear. The wife gets a husband's share, but the husband's share is still subject to the mortgage. So 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 basically, yeah, the wife can can sat or, or one spouse can saddle the other spouse with a mortgage, and, and we'll do this in family law I think, next week, the week after. I saw a hand somewhere over there. Yeah. We'll, we'll do that like in a week or two, okay? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do that like in two weeks, I promise. I didn't want to get too far into that, but it, it is actually salient. Yeah. So you said the husband's interest survives him. The, the, the mortgage is on the land. Right. At the present time, the husband owns the land. Due to the rights of survivorship, that land is transferred to the wife subject to the mortgage. Same way, if you inherit, say, say your father or your mother owns a piece of property subject to a mortgage, right? And then you inherit that land. The mortgage doesn't disappear. You get it with the mortgage on top of it. You're stuck. I mean, you can, can you imagine if mortgages ended at death? No bank would ever write them. It, it, it wouldn't happen. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, Matt, can the, can the mortgage be canceled by the wife then? Uh, no. But what can the wife see instead? Reimbursement of what? Her share. Well, what do, you, what do you mean her share? Her share of what? Well, of the... What would what, she actually suing for? What, what's that called? What, what, what payments are associated with the lease? Rent, yeah. Yes. She can sue for half the rent, right? So if the husband's getting $1,000 a month, she can probably sue for half that uh, or, or, or something like that. The, the, the husband has to account for this other co-tenant for whatever rent. Okay? And he's liable otherwise if he doesn't. Okay. Questions about that? Yes, sir. If she sues, if instead of a box and rooms a uh, little house, she has a right to walk in that house and her team. So and if not, she could out. Okay, okay. So at common law. Yes, but under modern law, there's landlord-tenant law, which limits the ability of a landlord to enter a tenant's property, right? So for any of your rent apartments, your landlord can't enter in whenever he wants. He has to give notice, or that's to be a reason, or some sort of you know, maintenance of whatever. So at common law, more or less, yes. At modern era, no. Wouldn't that defeat, like, immunities? Would it defeat what? Immunities with possession? Modern landlord-tenant law is a mess. We'll do it in a few weeks. It basically destroys common law, um, but we ignore it for now. So we will, I think the last two or three classes we'll do landlord-tenant law. There have been a lot of protections put in place to make things a lot easier for the land, for the tenant, which 
place severe limitations on the bundle of sticks and the ownership of the property of, uh, of the landlords, but we'll, we'll talk about that later. <coughs> Other questions? Technically, is she a landlord? She's not really a landlord. So, well, her joint tenant is, and any rent that the, goes to the joint tenant is responsible to be shared with. So, the, the notion of a landlord is a modern day term. The proper term would be lesser. She'd be a co lessor. With, with the, with Even though she's not privy to that contract, she would be by default. At common law, leases didn't have to be signed. Leases didn't have to be in paper. You could often have a lease that was not written. So, it wouldn't even matter. But now it actually would make a difference. But uh, so a lot of landlord tenant law in the last 50 years has been totally changed. Eviction, uh, procedures for eviction, I mean it's just it totally is different than what was a common law. So the stuff I'm giving here is that we're in a common law, but a modern law, it wouldn't even matter. I mean it would matter, but it's it's much less it's much less significant. But it's still today the case that if you have two joint tenants and one joint tenant leases a property. The other joint tenant can seek reimbursement for it. Okay? And if any of you bothered to read the uh, notes after the case, um, interestingly enough, it, it was actually called the uh, Orange County Athletic Club. It was changed into a wrestling venue, and then the wife had to change a part, and she agreed to lease it. Um, and actually, now it's, it's a site of Edison Field where the Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles Angels of Anaheim play uh, uh, baseball. All right, any other questions in that case? All right, let's go back to the beginning, please. The first case we did. Yes, yes, sir. Ladder, please. Yes, So, so what you could have said was by, by chopping down these trees, you diminish the value. But that would have been a suit to bring against her husband to join her. Because the, the lessee, the boxing guy, was, just, was doing it at the permission of, of the husband. So this would have been actually the two of them. Um, I, I think you'll, you'll see that in the, in the case we're about to do now, the mere fact that one joint tenant decreasing the value of the land to harm another won't always result in much. Because courts don't like to get involved with policing these kinds of things. Um, it's more like, hey, you're on the land, you gotta go work it out. Um, as long as one is not being denied access to this, this term of ouster, right, then it's fine. That, courts are mainly looking, so I mean, of the, of the four unities, right? The big one is we possession, is someone being ousted, and title, has someone conveyed their entire interest, right? Because if one joint tenant has, you know, a joint tenant fee simple, conveys to someone else, that will sever it. But if you notice, there's no, like, use or, like, efficiency or, you know, caring and sharing element, right? There's no using it, you know, as, as loving couples. It, uh, that doesn't matter. The courts, as long as these four units are, are maintained, will, will, will keep the uh, joint tenancy alive. Okay. So let's talk about... Uh, uh, Okay, let's talk about Hunter. Let's talk about partitions. Hunter, what are the two types of partitions we have? Okay, can you tell me what the difference is, please? Right. Okay, so um, uh, Lee, why would why would parties want to partition a joint tenancy? Lee? Why would they want? Yeah, why, why, would, why would two joint tenants want to partition their, their joint tenancy? What do you think? Why, why would they want to? Partition our land. By the way, partition is a court-ordered partition. This is not things that people arrive at by themselves. This is asking a court to do it. So why would party? Why would two joint tenants ever want to partition their land? Okay. 
Okay. Okay, so, so that's right. The partition only comes to play when there's a dispute, when there's something they actually have to go to court for. Let's see, Don, if two parties are in agreement, how can they split up a joint tenancy if, if, if they agree on things? Yeah, yeah, I mean, they, they, they agree they don't want a joint tenancy anymore. How can they get rid of it? Yeah, right? So if two parties agree on how to break up a joint tenancy, all they have to do is, is break up the unities. They could, they could each sell their interest to a third party, or maybe they could sell it to a third party and sell it back to one of the joint tenants, try and make one person happy to be simple. Partition, the topic of the, of the next case is, only comes into play when they don't agree on what to do. And play, if there's a disagreement, meaning one party wants to sell it and one party doesn't want to sell it, okay? The party who wants to sell it, which one will he prefer? One party that wants to sell it? Yeah, you have two joint tenants. One wants to sell the land, one doesn't. Which, it's an easy question, it'll be hard to follow. Yeah. Which, 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 the one who wants to sell it, which one is he going to use? Okay. And the person who doesn't want to sell the land, which one would you prefer? Okay, good. Now, now follow up. More often than not, if the first person, right, you said he, he wants position by sale, if he just wants to sell his interest, why does he just sell his interest and walk away? Why is he the court involved? Why can't he just sell his interest to someone else, have a joint tenancy, and walk away? Because it might affect the uh, interest of the other party. Oh, he doesn't care about that person. He's suing him. Yeah. This is actually a little tricky, but it goes to the point. Yeah, that sentimental tie to the land, or he lives on it, or business on it, or something. Yeah. Yeah, anyone else? I mean, he may have, like, I guess, like you said, he might have plans for his interest that, you know, a garbage <laughs> trade company right in the middle of the little thing. It's hard to sell your partial interest in property and nobody wants to buy it. Okay. All of you were absolutely correct. If the, the guy number one wants to sell, there's nothing stopping him. He doesn't want to get rid of the land. He just wants it free and clear. Like Raymond said, he doesn't want any strings attached with He maybe wants to sell to a developer without a garbage uh, a hall in the middle. Or, or like what everyone else said, he might want to run a business. He might want to use the entirety. So if it was up to him, right? He doesn't just want to sell his interest. He wants to kick the other guy off and buy the entire thing himself. So when we talk about a partition by sale, there's an auction, right? Let's see. Uh, Chris, I think you alluded to it. But who do you think will be the number one bidder at the auction? Yeah. Right? So let's talk about, you know, guy one and guy two. And then, okay, guy one wants to sell and will buy at the auction. Guy two wants partition in kind and probably can't afford to buy it. This, the idea of the partition is a blunt instrument to sever joint tenancies. It's when your joint tenant won't agree to separate with you. Because even if guy number one sells the land to someone else, the garbage truck person is still there and no one's going to buy it from him. This is a way of trying to kick off the joint tenancy. So Ryan, historically, how have courts viewed the, uh, this tactic of going through the partition by sale? I'm sorry, how have they viewed the tactic? Yeah, how courts approach requests for partition by sale, historically. Uh, I think courts usually prefer to be partition in kind. Why is that? Well, not just because it's easier. Why? <laughs> It's often not easier. Because courts aren't wanting to get into the sale of land. Provide an opinion and move on. Genesis or something else? I was on the other side. I thought the court favored selling it. No. Because they looked at it as it would be grossly unjust to deprive a person of property. Yeah. Right? So you got to think about it. There are two people on this land. One, number two. This guy wants to keep on his land doing what he's doing for years. Continue his business, continue his family, you know, maintain the status quo. 
and you got this other guy who wants to kick off this poor guy who won't be able to afford it at the auction. Courts like maintaining the status quo. Courts like to keep people's expectations solid. And historically, courts have always looked to the other guy, the person who wants to stay, and said, you know what? If one guy wants to stay and one guy wants to leave, we shouldn't force the guy to have to leave. Because, I mean, obviously, if this guy was willing to go through a sale, he would do it himself. He would need to go to court for it. He actually went to court to fight against me. He does not want to leave the land. And, and, and always, in these cases, we have the, you know, the, the person who refuses to leave because they have a garbage dump or whatever. They just they don't want to leave. And that's why these cases make it to the state you know, Supreme Courts. Okay? So then, uh, George, what happened in this case, in the, um, uh, the, what the, the, name of it, the, the Delfino case? Uh, Delfino, the balance is the Dal, yeah, Whatever. Uh, we kind of been alluding to it. They own a uh, large acreage of land in, uh, uh, I want to make sure I, I uh, Bristol. Everyone knows where Bristol, Connecticut is, right? Who, what's, what's Bristol famous for? Thank you. Okay, go on. I don't think I know what Bristol's for. It was that, you know, the commercials, like, for Sports Center, like, Bristol, Connecticut, whatever. Eels, Bristol. Yeah, go on. <laughs> yes. Right. Uh, and uh, so, major um, Delfino, they wanted to sell a portion of the land. Right, okay, and what about uh, Helen Valencius? Uh, but Valencius actually had a residence and a business located on the land, and not the land itself. She wanted to okay. get partition of time. Okay, okay, so, so here, here's your setup. Okay, this is actually plot of the land. The red boundary is the entirety of, of, this, of this plot, okay? Ms. Valencius owned this little, you know, like pentagon over here, the green. And on this, she kept some sort of a, of a trash hauling business. She didn't actually keep garbage. But she kept a lot of the equipment, trucks, and you know other various things that they were hauling trash. Okay. The uh, uh, Delfinos wanted to sell the land to a developer. Okay. But what developer in their right mind is going to buy a piece of land with the garbage hauling right next to it? No one. So I'm sure that the Delfinos approached Valencia and said, "Hey, listen, we have a tenancy in common." Let's both sell our interests, and we'll both cash out. Okay, Anthony, what do you think um, uh, Ms. Ms. Valen uh, Ms. Valencia said to that? She yeah, she declined it. So what? What did the um, what did the Delfinos do instead? Um, well, I let her that. No. What? What, what did they? What did they do in court? What did they? What? What did they? What did they want in court? Oh, they want to split. I guess. What kind of what kind of partition did the uh, Delfinos want? Well, they wanted to sell. Right, they wanted to partition by sale. Okay, and why did they want to sell it rather than partition it by kind? Right. Okay. And 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 Jared, what did the uh, what did the old lady want to do? Uh, she uh, yeah, she wanted to partition it. Right. In other words, she wanted to maintain her little uh, 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 pentagon over there. And actually, here's another map, which shows a little bit better. better. This is one in your book. Her, you can't really make the numbers, but her little pentagon was over here. So this would have been her, um, her, her plot of land. You can actually kind of separate it from everything else. Well, in your attempt to comment, you're not really dividing the land up. It's just the interest. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. This is where her garbage dump was. Well, I know that's where garbage, but she just wanted to say my interest would be where this garbage dump is. Although, so in her request for a petition in kind, this would have been her her her, 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 her this would have been her request, right? Okay. So you know they went to court, right? Uh, Delfino said we want a petition by sale, and then she said no, no, we want a petition by kind, and you know he, here's a way we could do it, okay. right? You actually have to su suggest how you want to petition it up, okay? So. Uh, Let's see, uh, Casey. What did the um, what did the trial court do here? Okay. What are some of the reasons why the trial court said it would be uh, harmful to the uh, to the parties to uh, order petition in kind? Mm -hmm. Uh, 
going to be a great prejudice for parties since the continuation of the business of the expert will be to refer to the development. Right, okay. So, so look at the level of abstraction here, right? They said they want to build all these nice residential subdivisions, and you're going to have this garbage hauling business across the street. This would harm the business of all the people living in this block. Okay? But, but Blake, what about where was the court's focus placed on the people who are already there or the people who are going to be coming there later? The people that will be coming there later. What do they think about poor Mrs. Uh, Valencia's business? Uh, they, or the trial court, I'm sorry. They, yeah. The trial court talked about how they, uh, her, her business wasn't up to code and so it would be they yeah. had the economic reasons why they Right, so they basically the trial court went this entire analysis. You haven't done zoning yet, so don't worry about it. But they said, listen, this is this business probably won't even pass the zoning code. Uh, so let's think economically. We're better off just to sell off this business and just get rid of it. And what happens to Mrs. Valencia's livelihood and the way she makes her income? Poof, be gone. Right, nothing. Presumably, that would be covered in the auction price. That she could consider part of the auction price as a way to get her livelihood back. But but more likely than not, not. Okay. So then, Raymond, what did the uh, what did the uh, court of appeals do? And what was the court's preference to go through the partition by kind or partition by sale? Partition uh, by kind. Yeah. And they said that this partition statute, I think from the year 1720s, it's been out for 300 years almost, that you want to uh, uh, focus on splitting the land up. That way you keep people where they are where they're already living. And you only do the sale in case of emergency. Okay? And they go through all these things about the best interest of the parties. Uh, and, and they wrote that, you know, even though she has a garbage business, it's not disruptive. And we still have to consider the livelihood of all the co-tenants, not just one of them. Okay? Yes, sir. Uh, it just, you know, is it really this easy or this cut and dry? As in, because she had a business in the 20s. I mean, what if she was an old lady, you know, always you know, crazy off a rocker? Mm -hmm. But she was like, I'm not selling. I want this part of land. And the land was the, the, the buyer. It could, was the, the, the buyer. You know, the so, would this court need to go in the average detail? It's, it's funny. My, in my proper due class, my dad yelled at me using the phrase old lady. He's like, people have mothers. But uh, so I, I think I said that when the old lady croaks, my dad actually got mad at me for saying that. But you'll see a common thread with my dad. In all the cases we'll study, you're always going to have some old lady who wants to do something that's not useful. You have some old lady who wants to use property in a manner that's not economically efficient in, in not stop. So I mean, the case I taught last week my dad got mad at me for, you have something called a covenant, which we'll say later. And this covenant says is there can't be any commercial construction in this area. Okay, so this old lady had this covenant on this piece of land, and the town wants to build a hospital on this abandoned piece of land. The hospital been great, you know, treat people, people can get sick, they can, you know, whatever. And this lady refused to release the covenant because this one lady would not release the covenant, they couldn't build a hospital, and they lost. And it makes no sense because obviously the hospital would not harm her. In fact, it probably would help her. She's quite old, but uh, this was somewhere in upstate New York. There wasn't much stuff going on. But again, the old lady held on to the covenant. So we see an old lady in a case is probably going to be doing something that doesn't make sense. Okay. <laughs> I, I, because they're fighting for principle, right? They have nothing. I mean, they have nothing else that they're even fighting for. They they just want the lamp, whatever. Anyway, okay. got it. <laughs> and in the event, if anyone read to the aftermath, this physical partition actually harmed uh, uh, Miss Helen. Um, she got her three lots, so um, basically like right around here, this region right there. But true to form, the town found that her garbage hauling lot was in violation of code, and she had to pay, I think, was it $26,000 to compensate all these new homeowners for living near this uh, 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 um, garbage business. And she eventually died of a heart attack at the age of 55, and she was still running her business. Anyway, I won't say she grew. My dad will get mad at me. Uh, but interestingly enough, though, um, there has been something of a trend in California to be more likely to order uh, partitions by sale. And the reason why is because it's usually the case that it'll bring a higher price. So, so like Raymond said, 
it's a lot easier to sell an entire plot of land without any of the strings attached and try to sell it with, you know, this, this, this chunk cut out with a, with a, a garbage hauling business. Okay? But in this case, they said that the rights of the co-tenant and the lady outweighed any concerns for the, uh, uh, all these other neighbors to hold. Yes, ma'am? What is Texas trying to do because we're more like a traditional state? Yeah, partition by con. I think, actually, if I remember correctly, there was actually a Texas case cited somewhere. Um, it might have been in the Alabama case, but I know there's a I think it's in the Alabama case. So yeah, Texas is usually traditional, and they, they will stick with a partition by kind. And, and it, it preserves the status quo versus trying to go for efficiency. OK? So in, in the uh, notes after the case, they mention a few different um, um, examples. So there's one from West Virginia, the Arkland versus Harper case. Um, and, and here, this actually, I think, goes to um, uh, uh, Andrew's question from, sorry, Adam's question before about gold. In this case, coal was discovered on part of the land, right? So if you have this huge chunk of land in the middle of nowhere, West Virginia, it's worthless, except for the one place we find coal. So the court actually ordered a partition in kind, okay, where they basically sectioned off the part with the uh, coal. Interestingly enough, they said we don't want to uh, upset people and we don't want to upset sentimental value. Okay, that, that that would definitely be a common law opinion. So even though there's coal in the land, it'll probably make the best sense to sell the entire plot. The West Virginia Supreme Court, sticking with tradition, said we will just sever it. it the book didn't discuss who got the land. I'm guessing probably the person who's, who's mining the coal, they got that portion of the land. I'm, I'm guessing, but I'm not sure about that. But then there's the other cases, Johnson versus Hendrickson, uh, uh, which involves you know, one of these cases where a father leaves you know, a third of the land to his widow, and then two nights each of his three kids. And whenever you have all these kids running around, they don't want to have to deal with all the things. So they want to partition by sale. And there the court actually ordered partition by sale. They said that the whole is greater than some of the parts, right? <laughs> so if you have, you know, say, ten sliver interest in a piece of land, it's basically worthless. No one's going to buy each of those slivers. But if you add together all those parts, it's actually worth a lot more. So that, those are cases of partition by sale uh, actually makes sense. Okay? Oops. All right. Uh, questions about that? Yes, ma'am. What, what depends? Yeah, I mean, and, and generally if you want to summarize, the common law rule was they almost never ordered a partition by sale. But in the modern trend, sometimes they will. Ooh, actually, perfect time, Raymond. But uh, the, no, I was going to call on you for this one, so I'm glad you're back. The, um, but what often happens, and the reason why this is important, is imagine if a, you know, father with ten children dies and tested, right? He leaves a land to all of his ten kids, and each of them shares his tenant in common. And one of those children dies and tested, and he has ten kids. Okay, and then the land, gets, his share gets chopped up ten times. Imagine each of those 10 kids has five more kids, and each die and test it. So effectively, we have one piece of land that might be chopped into hundreds of pieces. And this is actually fairly common among you know, people who don't have wills. Um, so in these cases, what actually happens is somewhat nefarious. So, so follow me. So imagine you have one piece of land that's chopped up in, say, 50 segments, right? All tenants in common. You have one rich guy. One rich guy comes in, and he buys the share from one of them. Okay. Now, the family might have been okay with all family members holding this land, but here this outsider guy has one share. Okay. The rich guy goes to court and says, Your Honor, I want a petition by sale. Who do you think is going to bid on it at the auction? Yeah. Rich guy. So this is actually a very common ploy. The book talks about this happened a lot with uh, uh, poor black farmers, where if a one rich guy buys a single share and then goes to court petition by sale, he can buy the entire thing at auction and basically take it for pennies where the family can't bid on it. Because, I mean, the auction, they start bidding low, right? And if no one else wants it, they each have, what, a 150th interest and not have any money in it, it basically goes away for pennies. So this is actually a fairly com well, not common, but it happens. Uh, and this is why courts don't like order petition by sale, because it allows one guy to hijack the entire process. Yes. Because you have to get the permission of all the different people, right? No bank's going to give you a mortgage when it's chopped up to 50 pieces. So you have to walk with cash. And then once a person buys at the auction, it has to be simple. They can mortgage it or do whatever, sell it. 
So you, th these get very messy when you have so many people dying and tested, giving it as tenants in common to all five of their kids and their five kids and their you know, brothers and sisters that get split up. Will the court be basically forced to do a question by sale in that kind of situation yeah. because it might be impossible? Yeah, I think that would be one of the cases where it would be impossible to petition by kind. There would just be too many people. It, it, yeah, right. the only option is petition by sale when there's 50 people sharing co-tenancy. This is like what you're... Yeah, so they, they're going to do a petition by sale? Yeah. Right. Any questions? So there's, there's an interesting problem. Uh, it was problem 7 on page 347. Um, and, and the setup was you have A and B. Uh, they're the heirs of a father, and the father in a rocking chair. And they can't agree who gets the chair. And A brings a partition action. So this is actually a partition action for a rocking chair, a family heirloom. Right? Who wants to try and guess what the court did here? No, he didn't do a solemn. He didn't cut the chair in half. It'd be pretty bad. I guess he could sit on her lap. I don't know. What? What? Give, give me other options. What else do you think happened? You can have the chair Monday through Wednesday. Chair. Close. So what the court said was A gets it for six months, and the B gets it for six months. And you repeat till one of you dies, and whoever survives gets to keep the chair. No. Ah, think about it. Yeah. I, I think that would be something like. I think I, I think it could be something like this. If you want to, I, I don't mean to torment you. To A and B for their joint lives, remainder to the survivor. Sorry, but that's effectively what it would be. Yeah, whoever survives keeps it. Be simple. So they, they can they can rock on. <laughs> no, that wasn't. No, actually, I swear they're not. I. <laughs> I actually do make these up on the spot. They're terrible, but in fact, if I see myself using a joke these last time, I try not to. It was bad because uh, last year I talked the same class twice in one day, and I thought I saw myself using the same jokes and I hated it. So I tried not to do that. All right. Any uh, any other questions in that case? All right. So the last case this is the the Spiller case. Uh, wasn't there a college football player named Spiller from Alabama? Or making it up? No, he was from Clemson. Okay, never mind. Close though. All right, so uh, this this was the Spiller case, and this case I think goes to a question I was asked before. But what happens when you have two joint tenants and they have to fight over how they're using the land in various uh, kinds of efficient manners? Okay. All right, so where was I up to? I did you. I did you. Okay, so uh, Jeremy, did I, did I call on you? I can't remember. No. Okay, you're next. Okay, so can you tell us the facts, please, of the Spiller case? Uh, so John Spiller and Hetty Macrath. They owned a building as tenants in common. Uh, they were leasing it to their party auto ride. Uh -huh. And when he left uh, Spiller, the planet moved in. Uh -huh. And after doing that, uh, Macarath wrote him a letter demanding that he either vacate his half of the building or pay her rent for it. Why, why, did, why did he make that request? Uh, I guess because... They assume that, I mean, they were getting money off of it. Right. Getting money from it when it was being rented, and at this point, you know, now your co-tenant is moved in and it's not getting any money. Right. So, so here's what happened, right? You had these two joint tenants, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the joint tenants leased it to this other company. So, um, Macarth was used to a steady stream of rent. He was used to a steady stream of money. Right? The tenant vacated. That money stopped. So, uh, uh, Matthew, generally, when you're joint tenants, two joint tenants, is there any responsibility for either to pay rent to each other? I don't think so, no. No. Okay. So, historically, rent wasn't a thing between joint tenants. The entire point of a joint tenancy is you both own it together. Your, your separate but uh, undivided interests, you own it together. If there's a lease, like with, for example, the boxing case, okay? One leases the land out. They share in the rents. They share the rents. But if there's no new tenant, there's no new rent. So Macra threw a letter saying, hey, listen, you either pay your half of the rental value or get out. Okay? Um, Ashley, what was, what was uh, uh, Spiller doing to the land that might warrant rent? What, what was he doing to the land?
Yeah, he was basically using it for junk. Okay. Why, Ashley? Why would um? Why would why would Spiller? I'm sorry. Why would Macroth expect rent for keeping junk in the building? What, what was your argument? Good, yeah, is, is, is your voice sore? I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll repeat that. I didn't mean, okay, so, so her point was, why would there be the expectation that you have to pay rent? Well, he said, listen, you're keeping all of your crap here, right? You're keeping all of your stuff. Because you're keeping your stuff here, you're, you're basically ousting me. What? Ousting me. Haley, what's, what's ouster? What's this word? Right. Okay, so we have this ouster, right? An ouster is a function of the last element of the four unities, possession. And generally it's said that when a person ousts a joint tenant or a co-tenant, that, or actually just, when a person ousts a joint tenant, then you lose the four unities. Okay? So, so Haley, is there any evidence that there was an ouster? Oh, question? Was was he taking up all the room? We didn't do that yet. We'll, we'll do the next semester, okay? Yeah. So um, it'll take like fifteen minutes to explain it, and I don't want to. But I'll I'll talk to you after class about it. So Lillian, so. Was the act of putting all this garbage here in this warehouse ouster? No. Why not? What? Yeah. So. So was Macron ever actually denied entry to the land? No. What about the locks in the door? Right, okay. So here we have a case where you have two joint tenants. Obviously, one is using the land in a way the other one doesn't like, right? And the one who's getting kicked out says, hey, pay me rent or else, you know, whatever. But in order for there to be rent, there cannot be rent if the joint tenancy is still existing. What he's trying to do is saying, listen, by asking me, you sever this joint tenancy, and then I can charge you rent. And does the court accept that, Alex? Does the court accept that this act of putting all the garbage here severs the, the, the unity? No. Okay, why not? Because uh, he's never told me ever Okay, right. So basically this case says unless there's a physical denial of access to the property, unless you're actually physically denied, you're kept out. So to use example four, you were kicked out of the boxing ring, right? There's no ouster. And as long as there's no ouster, you still have the four unities. And if you have the four unities, no rent. You can't charge rent. Okay. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, they were still joint tenants in the boxing ring. So yes. But she could still sue for her share of the rent. rent. Because there was, a, there, was a, there was a lessee, a tenant, paying the rent. Here, there's no one paying the rent. Now, let me ask you the question. What happens if the, if the land would have been rent, uh, leased out again? Would there be rent to be had? In the... In the warehouse. Yes, yes. And then that rent will be shared. Yes. Okay, everyone got that? All right, other questions? No, even if you're not ousted, if you're joint tenants and the land's being leased, you share in the rent. That, that's a boxing case. So if the third party comes in as a lease, mm -hmm. then uh, the 
you still doing things you need to cover them up a little bit between the proteins. Yeah. You that out. Yeah, yeah. If you have two joint tenants living together, there's no claim for rent. Yeah. Also? Um, so if you can physical access to the property, that would constitute ouster, but do you actually have to demand entry again, or is it just that... So... In order to prove that you were ousted, you usually need to show that you were denied entry. And I think the question is, you have to have denial for all cases of ouster. Generally, to show ouster, you need to prove that you tried to enter and you couldn't. You were kept out. And a common law, this was a very big deal, because that means you tried to go to the land and you were physically, forcibly removed. Okay? I mean, today it could be they padlocked the door and they didn't give you a key. Okay? But the mere fact that a building in Tuscaloosa has locks the door doesn't, doesn't mean you're asking. They just don't want to be robbed. No offense to people in Tuscaloosa. Yes, ma'am. Uh, a co-tenant uh, has to argue that they, they, they're, not, they're not just being given the physical uh, space that would reflect, on, I guess, the percentage of ownership. Even though I know co-tenants have access to the whole. But you and I own the building. You put your things in there, and it's occupying seventy-five percent of the square footage. Mm -hmm. I have enough things to occupy fifty percent of the square footage, but I can only put my little in the court. The bit that I can, I can take it to court. What ground no. I can't. But what this case shows is that it's too bad. When you have a joint tenant, you're stuck with them, and you're stuck with them using the land in a hogging manner where they hog it all for themselves. But you can threaten partition by sale. If it gets really bad, then you can threaten to partition. And, and, I mean, you can't really partition a warehouse, right? I mean, I guess you have this floor, I have this floor, but that makes no sense. So in the case of a warehouse, you partition by sale. But that wouldn't technically be ouster if I'm trying to access a certain portion of, and I'm being denied that? That's not how courts see it. Courts see it in a very literal sense. You're being denied entry to the land. Okay. I mean, the fact that we have these multi-story warehouses is irrelevant. That, that's what that's what Macro threat argues. They listen, there's so much junk here, I can't access a lot of the land. But the court rejected that outright. Just to have my notes correct, if we're co-tenants and you leased out a portion of your interest, I am uh, I am guaranteed a portion of the you, you get a cut of the rent. Yeah. I get a cut of the rent. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Um, I asked you to do this, uh, to schedule a, a time for the exam. Only 13 of you bothered. But I, I, th I think it's, it's representative enough. Um, uh, this is for the review session. So it seems that the two best days are Friday, I'm sorry, Monday the 25th and Friday the 29th. Those seem to be the two most popular days. Right, I know. So what, what time do you have class on Monday? Yeah. So, what what time do you have class on the twenty fifth? What do you have class in the morning? What? Yeah, the twenty fifth is last day of class. What what time are your classes on the twenty fifth? Twenty fifth is a Monday. Do you have a do you have a break at any time on Monday? Like like you said, your class finished at eleven. Yeah, not all the class. Okay. So what if we did something on the twenty fifth at like eleven thirty? I could do it at nine, but do you have class at nine? How many people have class at nine? How many people have class at 11? So one person has class at 11. So you have class at 11.30. All right. So your exam is the 2nd of December, right? It's the 2nd of December. You don't have that many days. Uh, I can do it. I I can, well, only two people voted for the twenty second. I I can do the twenty second. The the problem is no one has I no everyone has class that day, so I'm not considering whatever has class. 
Can you just record it? Well, I'm going to record it regardless, but I want people to actually be here. <laughs> so raise your hand. Who Friday the 22nd, who would it not work for? Who would it not work for? Why? Work, okay. Would anyone else Friday the 22nd will not work? Okay. What what time is best? Because I'm home that day. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. What's better, 9 or 12? 9. Okay. So... Raise your hand if Friday the 22nd at 9 will not work. Will not work. Friday the 22nd at 9 a.m. Is that good for almost everyone? Okay. All right, so. 9. Okay, so. All right, so everyone, shh. Okay. So we're going to do Friday the 22nd at 9. It's going to be, it's going to be roughly a three-hour block. So here, here's what's going to happen. You don't have to come. It's totally optional. Totally optional. Totally optional. I recommend you do it. The first 90 minutes, I'm going to proctor one of my questions from last year. I'll print it out, paper, whatever. You're going to type it up in your computer, okay? Use Word. I really don't care. Okay? After 90 minutes, I'll call time. And then either you can grade it yourself or you can email it to your neighbor. I don't really care. I don't want to see them. But what I will do is I'm going to go over the A-plus answer from last year. It's one of your own colleagues, one semester removed from you, wrote an answer, and, and he had the same you know, book and everything else. I'm going to go over it in a lot of detail. So basically the second 90-minute block, I'm just going to talk for almost 90 minutes, and we'll go over it. I'll answer all of your questions, and this will be roughly 10 days before your exam. So what I want from you, though, is I want you to actually review the material beforehand. The reason why I kind of prefer these dates, but it sucks with your exam so early because of Thanksgiving, is because you'll actually be cramming during these periods, and there are pluses and minuses. I don't want to do a review when you're right cramming because you're you're not in the right frame of mind and a lot of you will <coughs> Yeah, you'll be cramming. You're not gonna want to see for three hours, whatever. So take this as an experience, try to review as many of your notes as possible beforehand. And I don't like I'm sorry you have the exam right at Thanksgiving, it's just not a good time. I don't like my, my evening exam I think it's like the tenth to the twelfth, so it's just more time to think about it. But you guys not. Alright, so Everyone, right? So I'm going to write it here so it, it's in posterity. So it's going to be Friday the uh, 22nd at 9 a.m. And in a room to be determined, I don't, I don't know where, but it'll be in this building somewhere. Okay, any questions about that? Everyone good? All right, I will see you on Thursday. Have a good day.